Hello and welcome to episode 24 of the Just Run podcast with me, Rhys Morgan. Um, I'm riding solo tonight because Nathan is uh, currently in preparation and doing his packing for his upcoming exciting Wales Coastal Path adventure. So that actually is a big thing. Please, please keep an eye on his profile. He's going to be documenting it. Obviously, it's 880 miles and an incredible, incredible challenge and adventure. So please support him. He's also doing it for two wonderful charities. So, yeah, just keep an eye on that. We'll put all the links in here anyway. Good um, luck, Nathan. Good luck. Yeah, good luck to Nathan indeed. And that there you just heard is this week's guest. Uh, so, yeah, none other than uh, Scott Jenkins. So um, if... You don't know who Scott is. I'm going to give you a brief introduction because I could be here talking for the next six days if I tried to go into everything. But uh, he's a, a Welsh ultra endurance runner with one hell of an impressive CV. Um, accumulated over more than a decade. Um, the first Brit to run the triple crane of 200 mile races, which means running the Tahoe 200, the Coca Dona 250, and the Arizona, uh, sorry, and the Bigfoot 200 miler. He but he's also set the British record at the Moab 240. He's run My Dream Race, Badwater 135, through the hottest place on earth, Death Valley. Um, and all of this started what when he, by running 2,000 miles through America with his brother. So, uh, again, I'm going to keep it short and sweet and just let him do the talking for himself. But, yeah, thank you so much for coming on, Scott, and uh, welcome to the podcast. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here and um, thank you so much for inviting me along this evening. It's really great to chat to you about ultra running and you know, thank you for the kind words and the intro as well. And um, just uh, for clarity on the Triple Crown, it's Bigfoot 200, Moab 240 and um, Tahoe 200. But I have done Coca-Dona 250. Oh, I got it all wrong. That's my oh, fault. No, you're, you're fine, mate. You're fine. To be honest, I forget. I've done so many like races over the years that... <laughs> you never really stop to think about them and stuff. And um, yeah, I've been very lucky to have so many different adventures. And um, I just wanted to say to you as well, thank you for all, all the support as well as a fellow Welshman. It really means a lot to me. So um, yeah, thanks, man. I appreciate it. No problem at all. Anytime, man. Anytime we were talking just before you came on here and I said something which has genuinely resonated with with me and Nathan and so many runners locally, I can, I can honestly vouch that you know people like yourself and your brother it's you're just very inspiring to us all um you know we i've wanted to run ultras for very for a long time and it was only when i started to delve into this more and i found the likes of yourself and your brother and heard what you were doing um you know everyone talks about reading the ultra marathon man book with dean carnasis and everything yes i did that born to run yes i did that but then when i actually saw people who lived literally on my doorstep doing it it was like shit this can actually be done then this is this is not like this is achievable. And um, yeah, it was amazing. It's, it's you guys have inspired us massively um, and setting records all over the world. It's amazing. So well done to you for everything that you've achieved. <laughs> uh, that's so kind of you, Reese, And it really means a lot to me to to hear such like kind words, mate. It really does. And I, I think you used the word uh, achievable there. I, I think, um, you know, it, it is within the reach of most people, right? You can go out and, and have these adventures. And I think certainly since covid people have realized the the benefit of getting out and having an adventure being in the mountains pushing yourself outside your comfort zone and um i just you know encourage anyone to to give it a go whether it's a 5k 10k 50k whatever it may be set yourself a goal and push yourself outside the comfort zone and and sometimes you learn a lot about yourself and not just in terms of like oh i can go and run a 50k or 50 mile or whatever it is but actually, you'll learn lessons during the course of doing something like that that you can apply to your daily, you know, your day to day life. So, example, like, you know, when you stand on the start line of a, a race like the Coca Dona 250 and you think to yourself, well, you know, I could be running for 90 hours or, you know, five days or whatever it is. And, you know, that's a real challenge. That's a, a scary challenge to take on. But, you know, if then somebody says to you in work, oh, I need you to have this difficult conversation, and you're like, yeah, you know, it's not so difficult, actually. Running for 90 hours is quite difficult. So I found running has, um, has been a great way to put things and problems into perspective and learn lessons that you can apply to your day-to-day -day life, I think. Definitely. 100%. I agree with you. It definitely helps with uh, problem solving. <laughs> yeah, um, definitely. One thing I want to say first and foremost, which I can't believe I haven't mentioned yet, um, congrats on the massive news of your move to America, mate. Like I saw that the other day on your profile and 
I mean, we cannot possibly do this podcast without talking about that. Like, how awesome! What was what happened? Why America? Whereabouts are you living? Have you found somewhere yet? And do you want to tell us more about that? Yeah, and and thanks again. I appreciate that, mate. I um, you know what? It's uh, it's a move of mixed emotions because I love you know Wales. I love where I'm from. I love you know working and living in London as well. And um, I love the UK and the running scene out here too. And um, I uh. Yeah, I'm very excited to move. It's not without nerves as well, right? You know, you're moving to a new country, taking on new roles. And, you know, it's a, a new era of, of my life, I think, you know, in, in moving to the States. But it's one that's exciting. Uh, it's not gone beyond my notice that a lot more of the, the races that I want to do uh, in the future are going to be a lot easier and more accessible for me to get to. Um, but the, the first thing and the reason why I'm moving is um, me and my my wife, we both work for Johnson & Johnson in uh, MedTech and we've been lucky enough to to get moves to the US. So um, we're going to do it for a few years and embrace, uh, again, you know, going outside the comfort zone, a new challenge and a new way of living. But one that we're looking forward to, but um, I'm very proud to be from Wales. And uh, I was already looking the other night on uh, on the internet to find a, a nice big Welsh flag that I can attach to a pole that sits in our front yard, I guess you'd call it, in the States. So um, I'll yeah. be representing out there. And um, yeah, I'm very, very proud and feel very lucky to be able to, to get this opportunity and, and looking forward to a new challenge, I suppose. That's awesome. Have you so have you decided on where you're going to be staying, like uh, or, you know, the location, or are you still kind of on the hunt for a house at the moment? Literally uh, last week we were in uh, in the states. Like Jane Jay took us over to to do a home finding visit. So we're we're going to be moving to New Jersey, Princeton area. Um, I've always heard a little bit about mixed reviews on New Jersey, and um, you know it's quite industrialized in certain places. But you know what? It, it was beautiful. Like where we went um you know plenty of access to green countryside it was less built up certainly than you know where we are in london at the moment and um yeah i i think it's been really nice to have access to um to more trails on my doorstep you know living here in the city is quite challenging when you want to get out and, and tackle some hills or mountains you've got to drive minimum of an hour just to get to like surrey hills right now mm -hmm. I'll be able to access some real elevation pretty quickly which is great um the uh Appalachian Trail is within two hours drive as well of uh of where we're going to live so you know perfect place for me me to be able to train and um yeah just be a little bit closer to some trails and mountains which I think will only be a positive thing I think because I spend a lot of my time training on the treadmill at the moment um which is good and bad at the same time <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh yeah i know the feeling i i love the tre the treadmill is one of those necessary evils it's, it's a good tool it's a really good tool uh one i, I hurt my knee at the beginning of the year because i had like some kind of inflamed quad tendon i couldn't run outside on the tarmac and the trails it just hurt too much but the minute yeah. i got onto the treadmill and you know you got everything at the touch of a button yes i will admit i used to hate on them a lot but they are very good tools, but yeah, I mean, you're never going to replicate <laughs> getting out on the trails and stuff for you, whether it's in the UK or America, I think anyone would rather be outside. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. And uh, I suppose the, the one useful thing about it is because it's such a mental grind running on the trail, on, on the treadmill, when by the time you get to the trail or to a race, you're super excited because you're like, oh, look, I'm outdoors and like, it's beautiful scenery. This is going to be great. So yeah, yeah. It's, it's pros and cons for sure but i'd certainly say like you know in the in the build up to running the triple crown last year like it, it played a massive part in my training program yeah it's not ideal you know would i love to live in colorado at elevation running up and down the hard rock course every weekend of course i would but the, the reality is that's not my life and i just need to make the best of uh the um the tools and the facilities that that we've got right and you know yeah. it to do that and it certainly helped me anyway so yeah it's yeah good. i agree it's a good um, tool. obviously something i wanted to say um you know uh for those who don't know scott is reese's brother reese who runs pegasus and wild horse yep. and opponent and all these crazy events that we've done i mean I've listened to a bunch of podcasts you've been on and stuff like that before obviously with you know doing prep for this and what have you i've never heard anyone ask you and your brother, how were you growing up? And also in recent years, you've heard, because I've not got a brother, I've got a sister. Um, but yeah. I was going to say, if I was as competitive as you and, and also your brother, um, 
Have you ever been like, do you ever give each other a bit of a, a race banter dig? Be like, first first Brit to get triple king, bitch. What are you gonna do? <laughs> no, 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 never. Um, I'm I'm super proud of him and everything that he's achieved. And um, I guess you know, living up here, we don't speak or see as, each other as often as we'd probably like, but. Yeah, he, I hope that he knows that I'm very, very proud of him and everything he's accomplished for his run and everything I'm sure that he'll go on to accomplish. I think, you know, for me in the future, it'd be lovely to potentially get back to to doing a couple of challenges together one day. That would be good. Um, but yeah, he's a he's a great runner. He's done some incredible things. And um, yeah, looking forward to seeing what he uh, achieves in the future too. But from my perspective, I think it's just like, I just want to go out and and, you know, challenge myself push myself outside my comfort zone and it's something that I've done over the, the last 13 years Reese does the same thing as well and you I'm sure you know yourself you get into these ultras you become addicted to it and the lessons that it, it has taught me I directly attribute to you know my development in in business as well you know like we talked about earlier having the patience to um, run 100 miles and put up with the challenges and the problems and find solutions. Yes, they're not the same solutions that you have to find every day in a business life, but it gives you that kind of resilience and that ability to put problems into perspective. So for me, like, yeah, I, I owe running a lot and um, I'm very proud of what Reese has achieved as well. Awesome. I mean, I don't know if anybody knows your kind of backstory, but it always amazes me that your kind of entrance into the ultra world was running 2000 miles from Boston to Austin. Yeah, with Straight him, into the it? deep end, straight into the deep end <laughs> on that one. It was, um, yeah, again, like you just learned so much and I learned so much from that. And one day, a couple of years after doing that, I went to an interview for a job that, you know, perhaps before I ran Boston to Austin, I wouldn't have believed that, I could get and actually by doing a 2000 mile run, it gave me the confidence to go, you know what, if you can do that, then, you know, just throw your hat in the ring. What's the worst that can happen? You know, somebody says, no, well, it's not a problem. Just get back up and dust yourself off. And I went to an interview and, you know, the guy was impressed with you know what I'd accomplished career wise, but also the, the running side of things. And they ended up giving me a presentation to do for the second interview. And they said, um, you can three topics. And like the third one was like blood, sweat and tears. And I'm like, oh, you don't even know. <laughs> like, I'm just going to talk to you about Boston to Austin. I'm like, that's my specialist subject. So, you know, when I did that, I think uh, the um, well, I know for a fact the the lady that gave me that opportunity, Sam, she said to me, you know, if you can go out and run a marathon for 75 days and, and, and seven, you know, seven over 2000 miles, then um, I think we can uh, trust you to go and sell some hips and knees for us. And that was it. You know what? That's it, It's really mad, Scott, because I've not actually heard anybody talk about, I mean, I know we're quite young in the podcast, 24 episodes in, but I've not heard anybody talk about the mindset, the relationship between the mindset and ultra running. And, and then you're like, people have said, obviously, the relationship with mental health and stuff like that, which I fully get. Yeah. But your your attitude in terms of career growth and like adapting that uh, based around your experience and running, that's really interesting because yeah, you're right. I mean, it's it's all well and on, on one side you've got the the confidence because you've just run however many miles per day for 75 days across a big section of America and you're you're full of that confidence. You're like, well shit, if I can do that, I can do anything. But then on the flip side of that, then the person sat across the desk from you is also going to be impressed and will also see that. And it'll just, it, it, it goes two ways. And I've never thought about it that, yeah, that's, it, I mean, even more of a reason to get more people into ultra running and pushing themselves to these limits. Yeah, isn't definitely. It? And it's not an overconfidence. It's not a, an arrogance. I try to be as, as humble as I possibly can because I think humility is a, is a, it's a great trait in people. Um, but you can still be humble and, and determined. And I guess, you know, an example of using um, resilience and perspective from what I've learned in ultra running. So uh, earlier this year, I was asked to go and present um, to some pretty important people in the business. It was an audience of like 100 people in a, in a, an amazing venue in Prague. And right before I was about to present, and I practiced, you know, probably about 20 minutes before I was really kind of like, wow, like this is, you know, this is a big moment. You know, you, there's a lot of people here. They're super important and, you know, don't fuck it up kind of thing. No pressure. 
And then like five minutes before it, I just thought to myself, I could hear the guy talking on stage and I thought to myself, you know what? Like, this isn't actually scary. Like standing on the start line of a race like Badwater 135 in Death Valley, where the temperature is 52 degrees Celsius, that is a life-threatening, dangerous situation to be in. Yes, you've put yourself there willingly, but you've still got to do it. That's a scary situation. And you know what? Just by thinking about that and thinking about having to do that, or getting to do that, I should say, by getting to do that, it gave me the confidence to just you know, walk out on stage and, and present to that many people and, um, yeah, give a good uh, account of myself. But I wouldn't have been able to do that without the the, the kind of lessons that I'd learned from running because it gave me that reference point to go, now nah, you've got this, you got this. Yeah, that's really interesting. That's really interesting. And yeah, thank you for saying that because I think a lot of people will take will take a lot from that because they probably don't even realize that their confidence has been boosted by doing you know these kind of challenging things. Whether you're taking on ultras or whether you're taking on huge cycle distances or swimming, whatever it is, it's mad how that can then reflect into your your personal and and also career. So yeah, that's that's interesting. It's a good way to think about it. Um, thank you. Yeah. No, that's good. Um, just back to only Boston to Austin really quickly. What's the most vivid memory you have from that entire trip? If you were to say, there's, I know it's probably very difficult to say one, but I am intrigued. You know, your first, you jumped straight in the deep end, having never done any kind of ultra distances, and you did that whopping 2,000 miles, not really know what you're getting into. Is there one particular moment that you could pinpoint that is quite vivid that sticks out to you? Other than the the finish, which was uh, pretty nice, um, I would say that the kindness of of complete strangers was um, really something to kind of not behold, but you know, experience and um, the warmth of people when they understood what you were doing. So, example of that uh, was that. We were running, God knows what day of it it was, but we were running through Tennessee. And um, the way that the day would work was like, you know, somebody might be dealing with something one day, the next day somebody else is dealing with something. It's just the way it is in that kind of events. And, you know, on that day, I was um, running ahead a little bit of, of Reese and Rusty. Um, normally they were ahead of me, to be fair, but I I was running a little bit ahead. I finished before them and I just, we were in the middle of nowhere, re really in the boonies. So just sat on the curb and I didn't look what was behind me. I just sat on the curb and all of a sudden I could smell some barbecue food in the air. I'm like, Oh wow. That, you know, and rav ravenous and lost all kinds of weight since I started running. And uh, you're just hungry all the time. Basically I turned around and turns out I was sat on the curb of a Baptist church in, in rural Tennessee. There's two guys and they're cooking on a barrel barbecue in the parking lot of the, uh, of the church. So they, they kind of look at me because, you know, I, I don't really look like I'm from Tennessee. I'm in my running gear, got my leggings on. It's like October, November time. It's a bit chilly. I'm sat there looking, you know, pretty disheveled. And they came over and they said, uh, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm running from Boston to, to Austin. Like, you know, at that point, it was just like it was normal, but it wasn't normal. Um, and they were like, wow, that's amazing. Like, you must be really hungry. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm super hungry. And they were like come over like we'll we'll get you some burgers and some hot dogs and these were like real like you know good old boys like down there in Tennessee they got the blue Levi's on their check shirts and stuff and they uh they brought me over and they started to cook me some food and then Reese and Rusty finished and they made them some food next thing you know like half of this local community are down in the parking lot of this Baptist church chatting to us like it, you know it was amazing then they're like oh it, it was right before Halloween they're like do you want to do a hayride so they took us out on a hayride in the field and they're where are you staying tonight? We well, said, well, you know, our crew's going to pick us up. We're going to drive. They're like, no, it's like 40 miles away to the nearest, like, you know, big town. There's no hotels around here. You can sleep in the church. So we slept on the floor of the Baptist church. And then the next morning, the congregation, the community came back again. We got to say some prayers for these boys. They're running for 2,000 miles. And then, um, yeah, sent us on our way, loads of food, looked after us, which was amazing. And there were so many occasions like that. Anyway, we finished the run, you know, like a month or so later. And uh, I got home at Christmas that year and I had a, a Christmas card from uh, the Baptist Church in Tennessee wishing me a Merry Christmas. And I just thought, no way. that's amazing. So that's probably the story that sticks with me the most, just because 
it shows the generosity of strangers and gives you a little bit of faith that there's some really great people out there in the world, to be fair. Wow, that is that story just got better and better. I thought it, <laughs> it was I thought it hit the, the penultimate kind of high when you did your accent, off, which we're no, like good. there's hay rides, you're sleeping on the floor of the church, we're having prayers. And then the Christmas and then you and then you threw in your accent, which was top mate. I don't think you insulted anyone there, so that's good. <laughs> no, no, I, I thought my well, I'm I've got to fit in now, haven't I? Because I'm going outside the pond, so I've got to try and you know affect it a little bit, maybe a lot. <laughs> it's really mate, that is that's a really nice touching story, isn't it? This it, it goes to show like when you're having a really shit day and or you've come across some particularly horrible human beings, which there are plenty of, you yeah. think of stories like that and it just restores your faith. I mean, they didn't have to do that and how fantastic would it be now you're moving that way to maybe drop in just randomly one day and be like, remember me? No, just, I don't cool. think they'll remember me in fairness, but I appreciate it. I don't think there's any statues down there in, in Tennessee, but maybe I'll dig out the Christmas card. That'd be fun. It would be yeah, funny. Yeah, that. yeah, that'd be really good. Or take them one and be like returning the favour how many years later. <laughs> That's a good idea. I like that. There you go. Um yeah, mate. So, I mean, obviously, we've. I know you've spoken about this probably. Uh, I know you've been on a few podcasts previously, so I apologise for any kind of questions at the tune date. But I mean, we can't oh, mate, not talk about. Chat to you. Yeah, it's just, we can't not talk about the triple crane, can we, mate? We just can't. I mean, <laughs> I've listened to some really good podcasts with yourself, and um, my jaw's always on the floor listening to you. Everything from training right to to finishing these races and the whole process and everything in between. Thanks. I just blows my mind the the distances that you did but i don't think people understand that the short time between those distances that that's what gets me so do you want to just explain because i got it completely wrong at the beginning that's like what races they are and, and the time in between and, and and just your experience really just yeah so um the triple crowns free it consists of three 200 plus mile races in uh the us so the first one's the tahoe 200 which typically takes place in june the second one is the bigfoot 200 which takes place in august and then the third one is the moab 240 which takes place in october so normally they're quite well spread out but um i'd signed up to run the triple crown in 2023 um, unfortunately, there was a, a ton of snow that fell in Tahoe in the winter of um, 2022 going into 2023. They had 58 foot of snow, which still blows my mind. I'm not sure how anyone deals with that. But still, um, the problem was none of the snow melted by the time it got to June because you, you're running at a very high elevation. So June comes along and the, the race organizers, Destination Trail, who are amazing, they were like, look, you know, you've got two options. You can either defer to next year or you can come and run the race in, in July to, to all the runners. So I'm thinking, well, you know, it's going to be tough, but sod it. I'm, I'm, I'm geared up. I've trained. You never know what's around the corner. So I'm, I'm going to do it. So um, ended up running uh, the Tahoe 200 um, in the middle of July. And then two weeks later running the Bigfoot 200. So I, I didn't even come home from the States. I stayed out there and just traveled up and, and ran the Bigfoot 200 and then came home and, and flew to, uh, ran the Moab uh, race in October. Um, they're all very difficult races in different ways. You know, Tahoe, you've got the challenge of the, the high altitude. And actually, because you're at high altitude, you're above the tree line quite a bit, which means you've got a lot of sun exposure. There is forest. Of course, there's a lot of forest, Lake Tahoe. But for us coming from the UK, like, when you go out into that midday sun and it's like 40 degrees up there and you're above the tree line, you feel it pretty quickly. Um, the second race, you know, trying to recover from Tahoe to Bigfoot was really challenging. And I thought I would be, you know, I think it takes four to six weeks, maybe even longer to recover from a 200, but to, to flip it and do it in two weeks, you know, after the first one, Tahoe ended up being, uh, a 290 mile 19 mile adventure because uh the the course was a little bit longer than expected anyway bonus miles um bigfoot's the crux in my opinion of the triple crown um it's a very very rugged and remote race there you're in the deep pacific northwest backwards like you imagine the most remote kind of forest in wales or the uk and then times that by 10 and you're kind of close like it is what you'd see on tv where they're like ah I swear I saw a Bigfoot last week. There I go with my American accent again. Um, 
settling in. But it's true, like it's 47,000 feet of elevation incline and 47,000 feet of decline, but it's all on like really difficult technical trail that's got a lot of tree roots a lot of stones a lot of quarry like rock um and then moab is um a challenging race obviously it's 240 odd miles which is is difficult enough in the first place but then what people don't realize in october in moab in the day it could be 30 degrees celsius in the night it can be minus four and when you're running those kind of distances, you have to be thinking like one or two sections ahead whilst dealing with the problems that you're encountering and the challenges and the obstacles that you're encountering on that particular section. So like, you know, let's say it's the middle of the day and you're putting on a sun hoodie, you're shoving ice down your top and then you're thinking, well, actually it's going to get dark maybe around six and this is a 22 mile section. So I might not be to my crew by the time you know the sun goes down so then you're thinking this is mad i'm stuffing ice down my top but i need my puffer jacket i need my headlight um all those kind of things which sure it's easy on the first day but like by the time you get to the third night it's not so easy to do so the moab race is um is 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 tr- it's tough and yeah i was lucky enough to get to to run all three races in one year and um yeah i guess become the first brit to do it so i'm pretty chuffed with that how amazing is that? I got it. Touching on the recovery between Tahoe and Bigfoot. I mean, what did you do? Did you just, because like you said, normally it's four to six weeks. I mean, you're probably not even recovered then really to the best of your ability. But did you, like, were you able to run or was it just active recovery, like kind of stretching, walking, yeah. hiking? No, so like um, I uh, I'm coached by Jeff Browning um, from the states. Great coach, great person as well. And um, we talked about this a lot before I went over, and we had a plan in place. So as soon as I finished the race, it was just like one or two beers, obviously take the edge off, and then straight onto like a a high protein diet, right? So just trying to eat as much protein, protein shakes every day, all those things to try and um, help the the muscles uh, recover, and then. Um, dunking myself in a lot of ice baths so fortunately there's a lot of like cold rivers and lakes and stuff around tahoe we went up to wyoming montana you know those kind of areas where they film yellowstone so there's a lot of like cold lakes you can just go and sit in and i would do that on a daily basis as well um i did an iv um drip as well so you can go into centers out there like recovery centers and um literally you can be like right i've done this race it was particularly grueling and the doctor comes along and he's like, right, I think you need this, 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 and this in your IV. So that helped me to rehydrate massively. And then the the last thing I did was um, cryotherapy as well. So similar sort of place where you can just go in and do cryotherapy. So I, I thought that um, muscularly speaking, I, I thought that I'd recovered quite well. Um, and I actually felt pretty good when I was about to start Bigfoot. And then we started Bigfoot and then, um, I spent probably the first 50 to 60 miles just running and periodically being sick every now and again, which was, um, yeah, challenging and not particularly pleasant. And then my body kind of settled back down after about 60 miles. And it was like, all right, well, this is what we're doing. We're doing this this crazy stuff a little bit again. So it was, uh, yeah, it was a difficult experience. And um, I think the interesting thing, though, was that by the end of Bigfoot, I actually ran it quicker than I did the year before when I wasn't doing the triple crown, which was, um, yeah, I was pretty chuffed with that, even though I, I actually finished in 35th place and the year before I finished in 25th place, but that year I I ran it slower and this year I ran it quicker. But anyway, it is what it is. It was enough. It was enough to keep me in the hunt for the triple crown. And that's what I was most, you know, most important to me at that point, I suppose. Amazing. You mentioned Yellowstone. I finished the last episode of season five Don't last night. Don't tell me what happens. I've only no. finished two seasons, so I've got a lot to go. And I'm <laughs> no a fan. spoilers. I no, do don't like worry, I wouldn't do that. As well. So, yeah, I need to sit down with whiskey and watch the rest of that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll come to that, actually, and you'll love a whiskey. I've heard about you and, and uh, having that, the odd no shot comment. of that. No comment, Reese. no comment. <laughs> <laughs> um that's interesting. I've never done cryotherapy or anything, but yeah, I've always been interested in how you recover between those long races. And um, the reason, one of the reasons I've asked is because I was going to be doing it next year, but I'm actually doing it in 2026 now. Is 
because I just didn't think I'd give myself enough time to prepare and everything, but also financially. So I don't know if you've heard of Ultra X, the company. Yeah, so, no, um, yeah, really good races, really nice people that organise them too. Yeah, so in 2026, I've spoken to Sam, the co-founder and stuff, and he's helping me. Uh, I want to be the first to do them all in one year. So I'm basically awesome. going to be doing, yeah, all 13 or 12, I think it is now, actually, because I think they dropped the Azores. Um so I'm going to be doing all of them in one year, looking at getting a coach and stuff for that. And when I really bullet pointed everything and laid it all day, and the concerning thing for me was the the lack of time between the races and yeah. traveling, because obviously you've got to take into consideration the jet lag. You know, you're still going to be hurting ordinarily when you do a big run. And they're not, I mean, none of the runs are like um, on any single day or 100 miles, but they're, they're multi-day events. And obviously it's the altitude and the heat and everything. So for me, it's going to be a big challenge. And that's why I was quite interested in how you recovered in between that. And I think that's going to be something I'll be taking advantage of massive, going forward. Yeah. Massive part of it. And you mentioned about running between the races as well. And um, certainly I did it between Bigfoot and Moab because I had like eight weeks, but between, you know, uh, Bigfoot and Tahoe, I, I didn't run at all because I just thought there's no point. I know how to run. I'm not getting any medals for training runs out here. Like all I need to do is just mobilize and walk and look after myself. Right. Um, you know, I'm 43 now and uh, I had to think about that. I'm 43 <laughs> now and, you know, it's much more important to be kinder to myself in that scenario rather than be like, Hey, I've got to go out and run every day. Like just to put something on Strava, like it, just would have backfired on me personally when I got to Bigfoot. So I was uh, more of the the kind of, I'm just going to look after myself and do the right things here for a couple of weeks and hopefully it would pay off and it did. Well, yeah, it did. It paid off, definitely. And Thanks. something interesting about your race as well, and this fascinates me, is, I mean, I've done some ultras. I'm, I'm nowhere near your level or anything, but I've obviously done a few over here. They've always been in the Welsh Mountains. Um, well, there are thereabouts. Um, I did one, obviously, the opponent, your brother's one recently, which is fantastic. Congratulations. Um, thank you very much. I'm going to be bragging about that until the day I die. My very first <laughs> one, very proudly. Got a tattoo for it as well. Um, um, I So obviously over here, this, you know exactly where I'm going to go with this. We don't have to factor in any issues for wildlife. So, <laughs> I mean, we had to check our legs for ticks. Well, I was anyway, because a friend of mine who paced me is a very experienced ultra runner and he said just check it when you've come out with some long grass and everything really and there was the odd boisterous pig in one of the farm fields that was a bit <laughs> a bit skeptical of me i think he came charging up the fence probably because i'd had a bacon sani uh the previous checkpoint but anyway um i'm always uh, very interested in how diverse the wildlife is in particularly in america and i know that you've touched on this before where you've had interactions with black bears and mountain lions which legitimately terrifies me almost to the point where it puts me off wanting to ever do those runs legitimately um but i'm curious over here we have like lessons like it's like safety um kind of briefings on like foot care and stuff like that before you go out do you have like like kind of safety sessions on what to do if you encounter a beer or a mountain lion and stuff genuinely um no they, they do give you uh like an overview before the races and it's all it's in the runner's manuals as well and it tells you exactly what to do but um i think the reality of going out and and having those adventures is that anything could happen right and um part of that is of course the uh, exposure to the wildlife that live in those areas and yeah i i've, I've talked about it before but at tahoe um when I was there last year, I was running up the trail on day three of the race. I had a pacer with me, Lee Adams, and he can vouch for this. We were running up the trail and uh, there was literally two bear cubs in the middle of the trail. And Lee probably, <laughs> I wouldn't say he saved my life, but he definitely helped uh, preserve it for a little bit longer because he said, stop. And I, I was like, why? And he's like, there's two bear cubs in the trail. And I just hadn't seen them because we're, they were, we're, it's the middle of the day and the shadows in the deep forest coming off the off the tree so i just hadn't seen them i'm tired uh i said don't move there'll be a mother bear and and with that the the mother bear we just looked over to the left and probably like 50 meters in the trees like this mother bear just went stood up onto all fours and i just looked at it and i thought oh my god that thing is actually enormous but i was so tired that i just kind of stood there and didn't move and it sounds weird but i wasn't actually scared i was just kind of like 
curious, tired, confused. I'm like, is this really kind of happening? And I do a lot of running, all my running, really, my big races to support Operation Smile. And Operation Smile, they perform surgical intervention for children with cleft all around the world. And a lot of people don't have access to healthcare, right? So I kind of sat there on this trail and I sat on the, the side of it thinking, Jesus Christ, you know, we just seen three bears, two bear cubs and a mother bear. Like, this is a this is a serious undertaking. And I kind of thought to myself, I had this moment of clarity and I was like, it's nothing really compared to like somebody going into, um, you know, tracking a couple of days to try and get healthcare, which I met a mother and daughter when I was in Ethiopia in 2016 that did exactly that. So I thought, well, you know, we've, we've encountered some bears. Let's just get on with it. It is what it is. Um, the bears were scary. The mountain lions have been scarier for sure. Like black bear pretty much will, they just want your food. They, and you speak to Americans and they're like, yeah, they're just like raccoons. Uh, they're dangerous, very dangerous bears, but they're not anything compared to like uh, mountain lions. Mountain lions have been fortunate, unfortunate, whichever way you want to look at it, to encounter three times. The first time in Moab in 2021, I was leaving Shea Mountain Aid Station. I won't forget it because I've run down the trail, putting my head the torch on just before dark. And um, I looked up and just like 100 meters up the trail my head torch glimpsed against two green eyes slightly mm. green eyes and i um i immediately like i was like jesus christ what's that and i didn't think like oh that was a mountain lion i just stopped and started walking i was like oh, it can't have been anything I imagined it looked again it was gone um so i carried on walking another runner caught up to me and i ran with them for a little bit and then took off again and it was only the day after I was speaking to another runner and they were like, oh yeah, like green eyes, like that's a mountain lion, 100%. I was like, oh, <laughs> okay. Um, the second time was at Bigfoot. So on the, there's a section there, which is the hardest section of any race that I've personally encountered, which is the click attack section, completely overgrown, 18 miles. And it's just up and down, tons of elevation. It's a scary kind of weird place to be as well. Very, um, eerie is probably the best place to put it i i've been there twice running this, this section and overnight and just weird stuff happens on that trail people get lost gps is fail people have been pulled out by helicopter all sorts of stuff but the time that i was there I was running with wes plate makes a lot of uh youtube videos i'm sure people have seen his stuff on youtube and um my friend molly and we were coming up the trail and uh, i said we need to sleep we slept for 30 minutes and during that sleep i remembered like this purring noise. So the 30 minutes go by and Molly comes over and she shakes me on the arm and she says, uh, shh, wake up, wake up. I said, Molly, what's 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 going on? She said, uh, there's, there's a cat in the area. And I'm like, oh, was that the purring noise? And she's like, yes, definitely. And I'm like, okay. And then we moved up the trail and there was a fresh mountain lion turd in the middle of the trail and it was you know steaming for want of a better phrase but they they cover them over like uh like a domestic cat with, with kitty litter so you you can tell oh. there's a mountain lion so it, i didn't imagine the purring that did generally happen and wes plate would tell you that as well because he was there for it um and then uh the third time was in moab last year again so a lot of um a lot of cats in utah this time, and I put it up on my um, my Instagram as coming up the trail, and um, as it's coming up the trail. Uh, hey, how's it going? Um, Hi, how are you? Yeah, hey, how is Nathan? He's obviously finished packing. <laughs> I have, yeah, all done. We're just talking about um, mountain. Yeah, I heard mountain lion stuff. Yeah, like yeah, that. and um, I was coming up the trail, and I said to the pacer that was with me, Dev, and I said, Dev, there's something in the trees. So it's like watching us. And he's like, no, it's just deer. Uh, like looked over with a head torch and you could see two mountain lion in the in the bushes. So I got a quick video of that. And uh that was pretty terrifying as well. So yeah, I've had my encounters over the years, but uh it doesn't just, stop wanting to go back for more. And Nathan, by the way, lovely to meet you. And you yeah. Coca Dona, they briefed us on the snakes and the cactus and that kind of stuff. Like they advise you to carry a cone like uh, a really pointy comb at, at Coca Dona so that if the cactus gets stuck in you, you can use the cone just to lift the cactus straight out rather than having to pull them out with with tweezers, which is a good idea. Um, 
the current thing that I'm wrestling with is grizzly bears, not not literally wrestling with grizzly bears, but uh, <laughs> I'm I'm considering my options because uh, I am running a race in Canada in September called the Divide 200, which is up in the Rockies there. That is grizzly bear country, and you know it's very clearly spelled out in the in the race manual that they're they're they're, they're definitely there. So. I've got to consider for the first time that I'm probably going to have to run with some form of bear spray because I don't really, the black bears didn't worry me too much. The mountain lions, you know, I, I just didn't want to carry spray, but this time grizzly bears, I'm a little bit more, I've seen the revenant. I don't want to end up like Leo in the revenant. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, um, that was actually my next question because I've seen a couple of crazy videos Call it crazy if you want, I suppose, but um, where like male and female ultra runners in certain parts of America actually go with guns holstered and spree. And that was going to be my question. Are you um, like obviously in Canada, you are, you just answered that. But have you ever taken it with you or had to use it? Because I think yeah. it, it genuinely, I would love to say I do one of those races, Scott, I really would. But I think like when you get that eerie feeling like something's following you, like over here. Yeah. Like I said, it might be a bit of a boisterous pig or something or a wild boar. And that's a big, that's fine. I can handle that. But yeah, I passed a cow the other day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they can be. Cows, it's dangerous. Cows are dangerous, man. That's saying. <laughs> Mate, I would take a field full of cows over one baby mountain lion. It, it doesn't, it, it, it's just mad that you do it. Like, this is what I mean. Like, I don't think people understand. Like, they go, oh, that's mad, 200 miles. You don't think of all those little things you've got to consider that you're not just in, in some sections of the race fighting for your life over some of these horrible, rugged terrains and lack of sleep and everything. But it's also, yeah. you may come face to face with something ridiculous that you only see in films. It's nuts. Yeah. It's a life experience, though, as well, isn't it? And um, to your point, like, I think that's a great leveler in, in something like a 200 as well. Like, because you know you can go out and be like super fast and you see it every 200 i've been to you see it like people go out and they're like flat out running like it's a you know a marathon and you're like all right see you see you like in day two or day three at some point and and that's the thing right you've got to have a sleep strategy but also like not everyone you know you go through that first day you go through the first night but not everyone wants to keep pushing on like when it gets to the third night, are you going to go out into the darkness and into those areas where, you know, there are those kind of risks and yeah, you've got to make that decision. Like I've, I've seen, you know, people lay up at aid stations and go, nah, I'm, I'm just going to wait till the sun comes up and then I'll go. I've seen people do it. So like it, it's taken those risks to want to push yourself further and come out the other side, I suppose, isn't it? A little bit. And um, also, mm -hmm. Nathan, I wanted to say good luck for your run. Uh, Thank you. Hills. Um, I have a, a cow-based story to tell you, not to traumatise you, but um, <laughs> I remember uh, going to pace my brother when he did it. I paced him twice, so I went up to Anglesey and down onto the Pembrokeshire coastal path. And I distinctly remember uh running along the coastal path at one point and a field of cows that were fenced off clocked us and i've never seen cows run like this before you can ask reese uh he'll tell you but the cows were running like uh some kind of army out of a gladiator movie over the field towards us and on one side there's this cliff drop off and there's this flimsy little fence and i'm like oh my god <laughs> the cows were like literally spraying milk into the air as they were running towards us so um watch out for those cows mate i just got the funniest vision now of these an army of cows and just milk going everywhere that's, oh, that's ask my brother when you see him next he'll, he, i'm hopefully he'll remember but i remember it i've got to say this this run now that i'm about to do is kind of inspired by your brother and obviously then yourself as I got to know your brother a bit more and so like you're yeah, Boston to Houston. So you've got a, a lot to uh well you've got a lot to say about this. A lot a lot to answer for. Is that yeah, right? yeah. Thanks, Nathan. That's very kind of you to say, mate. And um I've never thought about it like that. I've always just thought I want to go out and kind of push myself and, and try to help others, right? Have an adventure and do some good at the same time. So um, for somebody to say that, they like, generally means a lot, mate. And I wish you all the very best with it, and hope you have a great run. Just uh, watch out for them cows. 
Yeah, can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, at least uh, if you get thirsty, you know you're going to have some milk if you want, if you're daring enough to get Protein all around, right? Protein all around. You must uh, share the tracking link as well. It'd be great to, to follow your journey, mate. Yeah, it'll be um, posted on, because uh, I'm going to use the Strava link. Um, okay. I've set up Strava and do it that way. Um, yeah. So it'll be posted on my Instagram every day, every morning. Awesome. Good luck, mate. Good luck. Thank you. Be amazing. Though. That's going to be amazing. Um, I wanted to discuss with you, Scott, as well, if you don't mind, just um, taking you back a little bit to Badwater because yeah, it is. I've spoken to you about it before. You very kindly said in the past, you know, you've done it a couple of times with your brother. In fact, your brother offered as well at some point, as and when I start taking it seriously, that um, you know, if you you'd offer advice and stuff, which is amazing. So thank you for that. But it's uh, I just I was listening to a podcast of yours in the past week or so when you said. Which which is awesome that you were able to when you were trying to train for like the heat training, you added like heaters to your garage and the hottest that it got at one point was fifty eight degrees yeah. and you were Blech. running on a treadmill. In it. Yeah, it's a bit uh, it's a bit warmer than a weekend in Porth Cole, isn't it? To be fair, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it was I think something with like the the hot races. I don't know why, but I seem to end up doing quite a lot of hot races in the states where they are right but um it's very difficult for for us you know coming from wales or the uk ireland scotland england wherever it is where you know we are celtic and we aren't really used to being in those kind of conditions and you know i often think you, you're going down to southern california to the you know the hottest place on earth and there's people down there that it's just another day for them, like literally turning up. They live in Southern California, it's 42, 43 all year round. So not all year round, but certainly during the summer months. So it's actually very difficult for, for us, this side of the pond, to go and train for that. So I thought, well, you know, what can we do? And I was chatting to my wife, Abby, about it. And she said, look, why don't we try Bikram yoga? So we went, went to Bikram yoga. I'm like, yeah, it's all right. But I'm just lying around in, in the heat, right? I'm not really doing anything. And then, you know, a month or two went past and she said, oh, you know, why don't we get the the actual heated panels that they use at Bikram Yoga and just put them on the ceiling of the, the gym? I could, I'd converted the garage into a gym. My treadmill was in there anyway. So it made sense that it was just, you know, it was, it was sealed. So I just got my dad very kindly to <laughs> because I don't know what I'm doing with that kind of stuff, to install them. They're on a thermostat. So whenever I want to crank the heat up i can take it up i think they go up all the way to like 75 or something ridiculous um i've not taken it there because i was worried about the electrics inside the panel of the the um treadmill starting to melt so i was like <laughs> we'll just try it and get it hotter and hotter until a point where it's hotter than the race will be got it up to 58 and that was more than enough but it's disgusting i've got to say it's not fun not fun at all but it worked right that's the most yeah. important um well question on that though what if so if you can't afford to buy the heaters or and install them in your garage or if you don't have the luxury of even having a garage yeah what would you say in terms of what, what is the best way to adapt to heat training would you say because you know just wondering out of curiosity um i think probably and you know yeah you're right like lucky to be able to to go and get those and the I mean, yes, they were relatively expensive, but they weren't like thousands of pounds. They were like more like, I think it was like 300 pounds for like two or three, which, you know, still a lot of money, of course. And I understand that. But for me, it was worth the investment because I, I wanted to to put it towards, you know, running that race. It was a dream. And I thought, well, you know, that was something that I needed to do because I knew it would help me achieve that dream. But it doesn't mean that that's what you have to do. I think you can you can go and buy like I and I tried it right I've got them in the garage as well like the electrical heaters which I just put around the treadmill and, and use those and those get you to a certain temperature and then you can just put layers on or you can just yeah. go out in the really hot sun and and put layers on and and that'll work too and yeah you, you don't have control exactly over what the temperature is but you're still raising your core temperature to a, a place where it's um you know, it's very challenging. The problem is, of course, that we don't seem to get much done in the UK anymore, do we, apart from today and maybe a couple of other days. So, but there you go. It's, um, yeah, I think, you know, running on the treadmill and having the heaters around it is probably the next best thing to do. That's good for advice. Us. 
Yeah, I will. I am. I am going to do it one day. I am going to do it one day. I well, anything said I can do to help, you just say the word, mate. I'm very happy to. Thank you very much. That means a lot, mate. Appreciate that because um, uh, I know you need a crew and stuff like that. So maybe I'll be calling on you one day. Well, um, I'm out there now. I'm going out there. So yeah, not a problem. Yeah, that'd be awesome. But um, the what I start taking it seriously, I wanted to do it for my fortieth, but that's happening next year. So that's that ain't going to happen. But it was. Um, yeah, I was just wondering when you were, when I heard you say that, I was like, I wonder what other options, because people say about running in saunas, but obviously not ideal unless you've got your own, which again, unless you've got a lot of money. But I've read about people running in like wetsuits and things like that in the heat as well, which um, is mental. I think your brother, didn't your brother do that actually? Or was it yourself? Uh, um, I've never run in a wetsuit. No. <laughs> imagine the chafing. That's exactly what yeah. I was thinking. I'm just like, yeah, no, that's not. So oh. Yeah, because it's, it's just they're so thick, aren't they? I mean, they keep you warm in freezing cold weather. So imagine, like, I'm sure it was your brother or somebody else who did it, and they wore layers over the top as well. Um, but I suppose there's all different ways. Yeah, that's um... yeah, and look, you know, I think when you you're chasing like, like, that was a ten year dream for me to go and run that race, and I felt that you know let's save and get those heaters, save a bit of money and, and buy those heaters because it's going to help me achieve the, the that dream. But like, let's face it, you know, most of us, if we go out on a night out, you go out for dinner and a couple of drinks, you're going to spend 100 quid anyway, aren't you? So maybe just curtail two of those nights out and put it towards something that's going to help you achieve something that you really want to do. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, I did, I'd never thought of that. That's a really good idea with the Bikram yoga things. I'll have to have a look into that because... I'm sure I'll be able to get them second hand or something from or something like that. So good idea. Yeah. yeah. Um with the <laughs> again, something I want to talk about, and I'm sorry, I know you've spoken about this before. Nathan, I don't know if you've heard this, but if you haven't, you're in for a treat, mate. I think Scott has the single most entertaining hallucination story <laughs> <laughs> of my I've ever heard. And I'll just say one word and you'll know what I mean. Which <laughs> you, 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 can you please tell it <laughs> yeah of course I will mate I'm very happy to I, I've told it so many times and um, it still seems very surreal now so um, yeah back in 2019 I was running Moab 240 for the first time and um, I'd never experienced sleep deprivation before so I just thought naively that I'll just go out and run as hard and as fast as I possibly can so uh, that's exactly what I did and I got to 200 miles into the race and I was sat in 15th place it was all going really really well uh, and the guy we were up at Giza Pass which is you know a long hard climb to get up there and people do you know they hunker down at Pole Canyon and they go after it when it gets light or you take the approach that I did and you just go straight through the night and go for it. So that's what I did. And um, by the time I got there, it was pretty disheveled and, and pretty knackered. And um, my crew said to me, Scott, how was the night? I said, oh, it was freezing. It was like minus four out. But it was okay because I saw two cowboys on a rock and they were like, we're, we're at, I think it was like maybe even 12,000 feet. And they're like, Scott, there's no cowboys out on the rocks. And I was like, no, no, they're really nice. It was like a John Wayne type guy and uh a Mexican looking chap. He had the, the sombrero and the, the poncho type thing. And he said, uh, you're doing a great job. Keep on going. So I was like, right. Okay, fine. So those cowboys didn't exist. They said, look, you know, you've got 40 miles to go now. You're in 15th place. You're doing way, way, way better than we ever expected. So why don't we give you some Red Bull and some Pro Plus and just go and get these 40 miles done. You'll be done before it gets dark. I said, all right, yeah, fine. So I had a couple of cans of Red Bull, some Pro Plus, and and took off from the aid station. And during that section, my friend um, Rid Morgan, he'd come over from Wales specifically for the race. It was you know, amazing of him to do, to pace me and support me. He was on that section with me, and he'll tell you the stories. But I just kept sitting down like on the trail and just didn't know where I was, confused. Why are you making me run this race again? Eventually I got into the last aid station. So now I've got 20 miles to go and I'm still in 15th place. And they're like, you know, you lost a bit of time there, but you, you're doing all right. Like you, um, I, I didn't know where I was. It was like, you know, who are you people? What, what am I doing here? Why am I running? You know, it's, this has gone on for a long time. So they, they said, look, let's make your pack as light as possible. We'll give you some more Red Bull, get it done. So off I go. And, um, I went off, run down the trail and, um, fell over a couple of times and I kept tripping over and then wandering off into the bushes, trying to lay down, coming back around and then trying to take a pee in the middle of the trail. And 
it starts to get dark and people start to overtake me. And then things took a, a more sinister turn when uh, I started getting chased by a witch. So um, you've got to imagine you're, the, you're in the middle of nowhere in Utah in the dark. You have no idea where you are and you're being chased by a witch. So, you know, I'm running away down this trail and there's, it's right near the Colorado River. So you've got huge drop offs, like thousands of feet, like, I keep falling over and eventually I did the only thing that I could do, which was to go and hide uh, cowardly under a rock uh, from the witch. Now they later told me that it took a, a couple of hours to find me, um, but I was hiding under this rock and hiding under the rock. And all the time I can hear uh, the, the witch calling out, Scott, Scott, where are you? Come out from under the rock, get out from under the rock. Where are you? Um, eventually the witch kind of stuck her head underneath the rock and I, I did the only thing I, I knew what to do which was to do the crucifix which as you know is internationally renowned to ward off witches and vampires of course I did that and I said away witch away witch and she said in a very broad Scottish accent I'm not a witch I'm your fucking wife you prick <laughs> <laughs> uh, turns out the witch was actually my wife who was pacing me on the last section so um yeah, it was uh, it was one of those situations where she couldn't get me out. Uh, I wouldn't come out from under the rock. And eventually another runner came along uh, and he stuck his head under the rock. They had a dog with him. And they said, uh, come out from under the rock. I was like, no, absolutely not. He said, I've got cookies. And something must have got me with the cookie word. <laughs> I was like, oh, what kind of cookies are they? They're, they're like Oreos. And I'm like, Okay, I'm coming out from under the rock. So I came out from under the rock and um, this other runner and Abby uh, got me to the finish and I ended up finishing in 35th place. So I lost 20 places in the last uh, 20 miles of, of the Moab 240 in 2019, all because I didn't know anything about sleep deprivation. Now, the nice part of this story that not too many people know is that in 2021, obviously I was disappointed i was happy that i finished and fortunate to do so but i went back and in 2021 when i got to mile 200 in the race i bedded down there to sleep for 20 minutes and when i got up the guy that got me out from under the rock jason wooden uh from utah had driven six hours to come and pace me on the last 40 miles of the race which was amazing like such a nice thing to do and he paced me the last 40 miles and we ended up crossing the the finish line in 15th place where I should have been two years before and I got to set the British record for the course so um yeah it was a, a special moment so certainly learned my lessons of sleep deprivation that's for sure <laughs> <laughs> always gets me that is this the away with you which it's just the funniest thing I I could just sit but you need to make a t-shirt or something out of that like you need to, I don't you, shit. <laughs> yeah. you still do that every time you have an argument with her yeah, away, away, away. <laughs> no, um, I have to refer to her as my loving wife now, Nathan. <laughs> is she in the room, is she? No, she's not, she's not, but she'll listen to this like she does. <laughs> so uh, if she is listening, I love you lots, of course. <laughs> Wait. That's amazing. Thanks. Honestly, it cracks me up, absolutely cracks me up. Um, we have to come round to, to um, I think... What looked to be one of your toughest races, you may elaborate on that obviously as well, was your recent attempt at the Cambrian Way, which looked <laughs> hellish, hellish. <laughs> um, I mean, is that one of the hardest races you've ever attempted, not races, but challenges you've ever attempted to do? Um, where should I start with that? So I obviously knew that I was going to be moving to the States and I've looked at the Cambrian Way for a long time and thought, I really want to do it. Obviously, it means a lot to me as a Welsh person to want to set it as well. So I was like, right, I'm going to go after it. But the problem that I had was that I had to commit to a time window. So I knew that I could only do those dates, just the way things are with with work and with all the commitments I've got moving to the, the States and also my other races that I've got coming up. So I'm like, that's it. I have to go on that date. Now, I was looking at the weather religiously for like a month before and all the way up to the Sunday before I started, it was sunny. And I'm like, this, this is too good to be true. I'm texting the crew. I'm like, weather looks great. You know, classic, like tempting fate. And then Monday it got cloudy. Tuesday it was 
like oh, this is not going to be good and then wednesday it was like literally an amber storm warning so i set off from conway i'm like well look, if i can get through the first day it'll be all right um the weather looks like it's going to get better on the thursday and it just got progressively worse so like I wear a Patagonia uh, Gore-Tex jacket in those kind of conditions. And that jacket was absolutely soaked through. Um, by the time I got up to the the Glidafower, the, the first aid station before, well, rolling aid station, I suppose, if you like, uh, before you go over the top of the Glidafower, it was just all of the, I mean, it's not even trail. There's no trail there. It's literally just like indistinct path. Um by the time I got to go up the Glidafau, everything was just washed out. So like at one point I found myself and uh, a, a work colleague, a friend, Chris, who very kindly come to, to help me because he lives in that part of the world. I mean, he'd never been into anything like that in his life. And I said, you know, I had to apologize to him. I said, I didn't realize it was going to be this bad. And it was dangerous. And like we were down climbing at one point, a, 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 what had become a waterfall. And it was just like, holy shit, this is, really gnarly more gnarly than i thought it was going to be and then even running alongside i forget the name of the lake just before the glitter flower it was the whole like it was like mid calf deep water and i was just like this is this is not good um so i got there saw the crew and another uh, friend of mine a guy called lee had come to pace me um to go over the top of the glitter flower and uh, again like just a great guy who said look i I'll come and knock out five, six miles for you, no problem. I'm like, yeah, fine, brilliant. So we set off and it's coming in sideways. You know what it's like in the Welsh mountains. You boys know it as well as I do. Like it gets misty, it gets dark, the wind's coming in sideways, the rain's coming in sideways and, um, you know, it's soaking you to the bone and you're thinking, okay, this is now becoming a bit of a hypothermic situation if I don't get over here pretty quickly. And I remember Lee saying to me, Oh, we'll be up and over here in like an hour and a half. And I said, mate, this is going to be longer than an hour and a half. And I think it ended up taking six hours because if you look at the glitter flower, like it's um it's difficult in good conditions to be able to see your way over the top. But by the time we got over the top, it was like literally it was a storm. Um and I, I'm not ashamed to say like I was genuinely concerned that we weren't gonna get down because I've got Gaia, I've got, you know, my Garmin GPX as well. I've got it on my watch. But problem was the rain was coming in so heavy, I couldn't open up Gaia, I couldn't open up the screen. My watch screen is so small that the rain is, as you know, when you run in the rain, it's very hard to see. It's obviously very, you know, it's now 10, 11 o'clock at night. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, we need to start making some calls here on how we get down because I don't want to be one of those people that, is calling out Mountain Rescue to come and get us. And, it, you know, it was very close to that kind of situation where you're thinking one slip, one roll of the ankle, you know, I'm already borderline hypothermic here. You know, two hours waiting for someone to get you might not be two hours, might be the end of it all. So, um, you know, it's not an exaggeration. It was a scary situation. At one point we found ourselves um, literally knee deep in a bog and it started getting deeper and it was right on the edge of a waterfall on the backside of the glitter flower. And I was like, oh my God. I again apologized to Lee. I said, Lee, I, I didn't realize, you know, just how bad it was going to get. We we're getting like 14 millimeters of rain an hour at that point, um, which I looked at after when I got down. But I've never been so happy to see like the small little lights of Penna Pass, uh, youth hostel. I was like, oh my God, we're, we're actually going to get down here. So then, um, yeah, slept overnight, got up the next morning and started going up Snowden. And um, it was just exactly the same conditions again. And I was thinking to myself, well, you know, there's a point here where I'm getting hyperthermic. I'm going into a section which I'll get through. That's not a problem. But when I get onto the next section, which is um, like a 20 mile section for a very remote mountainous area again, it's jeopardizing not only my health and safety, but the people around me as well. So at that point, you've got to make a decision, right? And go, yeah, it's a shame, but I'm just going to have to come back and do it a different day and maybe give myself a, a more flexible timeline to do it in. But I do intend to go back. I will do it. It's just uh, a case of being able to fit it in. So lesson learned, but uh, yeah, certainly an experience that I'm happy to have come out the other side of. <laughs>
<laughs> right, that sounds gnarly as hell. I mean, I saw the videos and stuff of you like shaking like a leaf, like from head to toe, like where you were yeah. uncontrollably shaking and it looked horrendous. But then when you said all of that and you really put it into perspective, like that sounds, I think I'd take the, uh, the black bears made all of that. Yeah, I think it's just having a bit of humility and understanding the mountains as well. Like, you know, I understand the mountains have been, you know, in much bigger mountains and more dangerous conditions, but um, it just shows you that you can have those kind of situations change real quick. And I think the Welsh mountains are some of the toughest environment on, on earth. And that's based on running in some pretty gnarly conditions. Like the temperature the wind the rain the conditions can change so quickly especially up there next to the irish sea so um yeah it's uh it's part of uh the risks you take and it's also part of um part of the game with ultra running right you know if if you knew that every run that you set out on was going to be a success you know a positive end to the challenge then would it ever be a challenge in the first place wouldn't really, would it? So, you know, you've got to take with a rough with a smooth sometimes. Yeah, like the saying, if, if it was easy, everyone would do it. Yeah. It's yeah. exactly that. Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. uh, it was a, a tough experience, but one that, you know, I've learned a lot from, for sure. Hmm. I think a question I wanted to ask you as well, mate, is because this is something that me and Nathan ask, and I know everyone asks it, is bucket list races, but I mean, you've done some of the most iconic and real races in the world, and you, you move into Thanks. a part of the world now where you've literally got a lot more of them, you know, on your on your back door. Um, so I am very. This is. I'm even more curious with someone like yourself who's who's done so much. Is there a race that you've not done that you kind of obviously you want to do Cameroon Way, which is the one we've just spoken about? So aside from that, is there like? A race that you've always thought, oh, I'd like yeah, to do definitely. that in my reach. Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, I've got a list that it never stops growing, but there are Western states for sure I would love to do. Um, yeah, that that one for sure I'd love to do just to get that buckle. It looks really cool. Um, what else? Tour de Gion, so I'd love to do as well. Um, UTMB I would like to do for the atmosphere, nothing else. Um, mm -hmm. I just would love to do it. If it wasn't for, you know, the huge crowds, I, I wouldn't be, you know, that enamoured with it. I'd be quite happy to go and just run that circular route when there's not tons of people running at the same time. But the, the crowds add something different. So I, I would love to go and do that now. Um, Going to be lucky enough to go and do the Divide 200. Obviously, it's a, a fairly new race. It only started last year, but running the Canadian Rockies is going to be amazing. Uh, I'm also doing the Kodiak 100 in California in uh Sep uh, October, so divide September, Kodiak's October. Um, I'm going to be going to run the uh, Arizona Monster 300 uh, miler down in Arizona, Tucson, Arizona in April next year. So I've got so many like good races to look forward to, and there's so many more like you know, Vermont 100, Old Dominion, like maybe even get down the Keys, do that 100. There's just so many out there, but. Um, yeah, Cam Brian Way is definitely still high, high up there just because it's where we're from, isn't it? And that's what I want to do. So. Yeah, I'm waiting for Nathan to ask his question. He asks everyone. You there, Nate? Where's he gone? Sorry, I had to shut the door. I'm in the no, kitchen sorry. and the next door's out at the back is shouting. That's <laughs> all right. I was I, I'm waiting for you when we're talking about bucket list races. I was waiting for you to ask about the race that you ask everyone. Oh yeah, Dragon's Back. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah, Dragon's Back I would like to do, but I always thought to myself, if I do the Cambrai and FKT, um, then that's the equivalent of Dragon's Back. So yeah. How far is um Cambrai? Uh three hundred miles um and like eighty thousand foot of elevation gain and I would get to finish on Penarth Pier, which is where I'm from. So that would mean the world to me. That would be really and What's cool. the current um, record on that? Um, the self-supported record is like six days. So it's pretty uh, pretty punchy, to be fair. There you go. Reese is your fault, yes. <laughs> you are on a fucking laugh, are you? <laughs> I mean, who knows, actually? Maybe I will, but... Yeah, yeah well, plan next year, yeah. So let's well, do. Scott will only come back and take it off me if I do. <laughs> I don't know about <laughs> that. Not, 
I gotta find no, the time to do it as well, but yeah, one day it would be a dream. One day, one day. Yeah, that'd be amazing. But yeah, it was it was that was such an interesting race to look at because uh, I was gonna come down. I know a few people were gonna come down, but you'll get it one day, mate. I know you will. You've got that kind I appreciate of commitment. that. Thank but, you. Um yeah. Um yeah, I think I, I mean obviously God, we've covered off a lot there, mate. And I just yeah, just I don't know if there's anything you want to talk about in particular, Scott, as well, but I just um I mean you've covered off so much and I am very conscious of your time as well and everything you've got Thank going you. on. So no, it's a pleasure to chat to you guys. I think, um, you know, if, if I was going to cover off one thing, it would just be the the point around the the charity side of the the running. You know, very passionate, like I say, about raising money for Operation Smile. It's a wonderful charity and um, provides surgical intervention for children with like cleft lip, cleft palate all around the world and costs like $160 to change someone's life forever. So I think the thing with me and my running is that I've always thought to myself, when I get older in life, I want to kind of remember having adventures and sharing those adventures with my friends, with my family, with my colleagues, um, but also doing some good on that journey as well. And um, I can't think of anything better than trying to put smiles on people's faces. So that's what I do. And uh, I I urge people awesome. to thank you. I appreciate Over the it. years, do you know how much you've actually raised for charity? Do you know what? I've never sat down and and tallied it all up, but I know I've raised 135 smiles for for Operation Smile, and uh, the way I look at that is like, yeah, it's um, yeah, hope hopefully making a difference to to people to be able to do something that we take for granted, right? Because you know we get on here this evening, obviously we're, we're kind of meeting for the first time, and the first thing you do is smile and create that warmth, and I think it's very sad that people don't have that opportunity just because they don't have access to healthcare. So for me, mm. like. You know, the the money side of it is is obviously very nice and very grateful for the, the support, but actually understanding the tangible difference you can make to someone's life and knowing you can change that many people's lives is uh, that's better than any buckle or any medal anyone can ever give me. That's such Definitely. a good answer. Yeah, I don't brilliant. think there's any questions that I want to ask you after that. That's such a lovely yeah. place to end that's got because, I mean, yeah, you can't... What else can you say? We get to, we get to do this, and we're very fortunate in a lot of aspects. And I think subconsciously, all of us take advantage of those little things that we don't consider. And like you said, being able to put a smile on someone's face, you know, is because they can't afford to. And it's not a lot, like you said, hundred and sixty dollars was it pounds, and you're able to give them that life changing operation. It's Thanks, incredible. Scott. So I think, um, yeah, thank you, everyone. We say, well done, mate. That's incredible what you're doing really really is incredible thank you and and thank you for all the support and and thank you so much for having me on the show it's been great to chat to you guys and yeah just wishing nathan the best of luck with, with your race and and reese the best of luck with your challenge as well with the ultra x races and um yeah just hope, hope you guys have a great time out there on the trail and and catch you down there sometime soon definitely, definitely. yeah we'll so catch much, up scott. thank you yeah cheers scott you take care good luck with america Take Guys, care, mate. Yeah, Love bye. You. See you later. Bye bye. Wicked episode. Yeah, it was quite interesting because I heard the bit when you said about sort of like how it relates or like transfers into your work life. Mate, that was I, I had to dwell on that because I, 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 I've, I've always thought that to be honest because I I look at work now as not stressful. It's like oh, this is really important. It's not fucking mm -hmm. hard. There's more. Mm -hmm. There's harder things to worry about, and more important things to worry about than, than this. So yeah, I mm. can totally like relate to that. And it's only when he said that I thought about this. It, true, like you just. I've had days when I'm working from home or in the office, and I got a real difficult case I'm dealing with, and I'm just like, it's just fucking nothing. It's a walk in a park, like I whatever. And it's but I've never really dwelled on it, and nobody yeah. else ever has. And he's never. Listen, I've listened to quite a few of his podcasts recently, and that's, he's never brought it up, or no one's ever dwelled on that. And the way he talked about it, I think a lot of people are going to like that because it's true. It's, it's not egotistical or being big headed, it's being proud of what you've achieved and using that to progress your career. Like he sounds like he got the job that he's been doing now for a long time based off the back of, you know, his experience running 2,000 miles in America. So, yeah. Unreal. Yeah, cool. What a guy. What a guy. As always, thank you to anyone who has tuned in, listened and subscribed to our previous episodes. You, well, we love you all. Just thank you so much. We've had some amazing guests. 
Um, and I think you can all agree tonight with Scott is no exception. It's incredible. Um, just wanted to say to my co-host and friend, Nathan, good luck and all the best on your upcoming Wales Coastal Path um, challenge. It's, everyone is behind you, mate. It's a hell of a challenge. You're doing it for amazing charity and genuinely very proud of what you're doing, mate, and you should be too. And I hope you have the best time and enjoy every moment. And um, yeah, by the time this goes out, <laughs> You joked about this prior to me doing this, but you you may have finished. Um, you could be somewhere lying on the side of a, the trail in Pembroke, or you, you could have DNF'd. Who knows? You could be on your way back home by now. But um, either way, make all the best with it. And we're all behind you, man. And we're all super proud. So good luck with it, man. Cheers, Reese. No problem. Looking and, uh, forward yeah. to it. Yes, cannot wait. Cannot wait to hear the adventures and the stories and see all the footage. And I'm sure everyone is is uh, agreeing with me there. So yeah, all the best, mate. And um, thank you so much again to everyone who's tuned in. And um, yeah, take care. Cheers, guys. Bye.